I'm joined by Arizona State head coach Herm Edwards. Coach, how you doing? I am well. Um, and you know, this month in college football, generally, it is recruiting. I, I say that, but recruiting is 12 months out of the year. But <laughs> this generally is a big month because for most coaches at this point in time, they would be out of the offices. But due to the restrictions, um, we're doing a lot of that through Zoom. Uh, next month will be our, our, the ability for most of the coaches in the country to actually go out and uh, get on the road as, as well as bring players in uh, on your campus to evaluate them as well. One of the things that I thought was interesting about last year in recruiting and this year in recruiting is just how much coaches miss things that they sort of took for granted, like talking to people, uh, getting to know them in their homes, getting to shake hands with folks, hug folks, get to know mama, get to be in the kitchen. What were some of those things that you missed? Well, you mentioned it, uh, the personal touch. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's much more comfortable when you can talk to people face-to-face. Uh, -face. You, you feel that, that energy that, that, that comes from the conversations. Um, but here again, I think everyone had to, to adjust. I mean, one thing we can say, um, we all have had the ability to adjust, regardless of what we, whether we like it or not. And I think what's really kind of funny this Zoom thing has become one of those deals where we're, I'm kind of Zoomed out <laughs> because everybody wants to have a Zoom meeting all of a sudden. You know, before you could, you know, people didn't, okay, well, we got to cancel the meeting. Now it's kind of like, oh, can we have another Zoom meeting? I'm saying, man, I'm Zoomed out, man. I only got so many Zooms every day. <laughs> but everybody wants to have a Zoom meeting. I, I ask that question all the time. Like, can we do this in a phone call? Is that, do, you, do I need to sit down for this? Okay, right. all right. Uh, well, I, I guess... But then the other part of that is the the virtual tour yes. became a term that I we'd never heard before, and now we hear all the time. Do you see things like that staying in your organization? I think it helps you, obviously, and I think it helps the recruits too. I mean, if you're a recruit and you only have five official visits, um, that becomes very difficult if you're a highly recruited athlete. So if you could think about it this way now, let's just say you got a top five, but there's maybe three or four more you really want to see. Virtual tour is the way to go about doing it, right? That might change it. That might even change your mind to decide, you know what? I kind of like that. Maybe I ought to make that an official visit instead of a virtual tour visit. So I think it can help you uh, as an athlete. It helps, it helps coaches for sure because you have the ability to, to see the athlete, to see the family. And I think the thing that we've realized with the virtual tour, they can meet everyone in your organization. Gentlemen, we have virtual tours. I mean, the ADs involved in it, um, all, the, all the staff people that are involved in recruiting the student athletes, not just the coaches, it's the trainers, it's the equipment men. They meet all these different, there must be 20 people in the box, right? Mm -hmm. when you're meeting this family and um, the ADs in the box, the assistant ADs in the box, the head coaches in the, I mean, so it's kind of interesting how many people could get involved in a virtual tour. Last year, y'all were one of the few programs that actually got some practices in before the shutdown. This year, getting a full spring in, how much better do you feel about your football team? Well, there's a lot to gain in spring football. There's a reason why they do that, obviously. And, and one, for us, because we had so many guys coming back that we decided to come back, we only really lost two players off this team. Frank Darby, the receiver, got drafted for the Atlanta Falcons and we had a fifth year senior that graduated and he's gonna move on. He's gonna to go to the business world. But we had a lot of other guys that decided to come back. But I think the key for us was, I treated it almost like in pro football. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a veteran group of guys, it was really good for us to let a lot of the young guys, we had 11, 12 freshmen come in in the spring. Plus we had some sophomore kids and some freshmen last year who didn't play a lot, didn't participate. So spring ball was really, about those young guys more than the veteran guys. So the veterans wore the, wore the vet hat. You know, they would practice a couple of days and then all of a sudden, okay, you got to help us coach now. So a lot of young players got the repetitions uh, that they did not get last year. And I think that'll help. You mentioned spring ball being sort of helpful, right? But I wonder this, what was spring ball like when you were at Cal? Well, the Cal Berkeley's now, that's a whole different deal. That's... <laughs> <laughs> the team we had was pretty good. 11 guys off that team were pro football players. <laughs> You're talking Chuck Muncie, Wesley Walker, uh, Steve Burkowski, Vince Ferragamo. It was quite competitive, to say the least. Um, but, uh, you know, that was my first days in college when you go to, go to Cal right out of high school. And 
you know, you don't really know a lot about spring ball. All of a sudden you get, you get involved in spring football and you say, wow. And, and, you know, you figure out, you know, this thing is real, right? And, and, and it was a lot of fun for sure. But um, you learn a lot about yourself, I think, if you're a freshman coming in and after you've gone through a season, the confidence you gained after that season going into spring ball, I mean, it's tremendous. Because now you feel like, you know what, I've gone through my freshman year. Now I can, in this going into my sophomore year, I'm going to have spring ball. You just feel more confident as a football player. I'll bring up your time at Cal because I was doing some research preparing for this interview, and there's still a record you have that stands. <laughs> Do you know what that record is? The interceptions in one game? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was fortunate. Um, it was just one of those days they threw the ball five times and I knocked one down and intercepted the other four. But um, <laughs> you say that like it's like, like it's just ain't no thing. <laughs> well, I was pretty good catching. You know, I, I was one of those guys in high school that um, we had a pretty good high school football team. I went to Monterey High School. I actually got bust out of the, out of Seaside where I live and went across the town to go to a predominantly a white high school back in 68 when I was in high school, President Johnson. Uh, signed the desegregation bill, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, it was about bringing minorities to different schools. So I got bust over there. Had a really good football team, actually. Lost one game in three years. So growing up, uh, I was a Bob Hayes fan. Hmm. I wanted to play wide receiver, right? Love the Dallas Cowboys and 422, going to high school football and saying, man, I'm going to catch all these passes, these touchdowns. We ran the option. <laughs> I played tight end, end, and I was a free safety, right? So I said, man, if they ain't going to throw me the ball, I'm going to have to intercept the ball. So I had pretty good hands. I, you know, I, I, I could intercept balls, and that was a natural deal for me. And then, obviously, when I got to college, uh, my first, first year at Cal, I actually played uh, safety because I was a safety in high school. And then I moved to corner, and I got, I got the four, the four when, when I was playing corner against Washington State. Um, but um, I was always pretty good catching the football. You know, I, I, my claim to fame, I tell people all the time, from high school to college to professional football, I never missed a practice. I never missed a start. Mm. So that was kind of my claim to fame. I was one of those guys that knew that the most important thing in life is not only being coachable, but being available. And so I was always available because, you know, the game of football is a game of, 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 of preparation, practice. Uh, you practice more than you play. And uh, I was always in the mindset of the fact that you get better on the grass. When you put your cleats on the grass, that's where you, that's where you dig your, your career out. You dig, it in, you, you dig it out on the grass and you got to work at it. And that was always my work ethic and how I was, how I was built. You know, you, in pro football, I almost had four in one game. Uh, but someone knocked one away, but I ended up with 38 of them total. So I could catch the football pretty good. So have quarterbacks gotten that much better or were they that much worse? Didn't throw the ball as much. Mm. Right. When, when I entered pro football, uh, even college football was not a passing, it was a running league in the professional football league. I mean, if you threw 25 passes in a game, that was a lot. You can throw 25 passes now in, in the first half, right? Way to throw a football. I tell people all the time, I said, you know, if I played in this era, I'd have had 50 interceptions <laughs> because they throw the ball so much. Get more opportunities, but that's just me. That's what I. That's how I think, right? But 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 really, I I think the quarterbacks are much better. Offenses, the players are much better. They're bigger, they're faster, they're they're more skilled. Not saying that players in the era that I played in could not play, but the game has changed. The game is no longer played inside the hash marks. The game is played horizontally and vertically, and it's played in space. You have to be a space player now to play football. Uh, at any level. I mean, the ball is in the air. They want to get one-on-one -on -one matchups, whether they're running the ball or throwing the ball, they put athletes in space. And if you can survive in space, you can, you can have a pretty good career in pro football. And your program reflects that uh, two guys that jump out to me in particular, uh, Chase Lucas and Jaden Daniels, but I could also throw in there like Merlin Robertson and, uh, and others Jaden, I point to because when we talk about, we don't use dual threat anymore, right? right? You either can go or you can't. And I need to be able to play 11 on 11 and not 10 on 11. But y'all also run the ball and you play outstanding defense. 
How have you molded those two concepts together, playing modern football, but also we want to run the ball and be physical defensively? Well, football never changes, in my opinion, and I've been involved in a long, long time. Um, you, know, you, throw, you throw the ball to score, you run the ball to win. And I think when you have that combination, uh, when you can run the ball, you become much more physical on both sides of the ball, offensively and defensively up front. Because you got to be able to stop the run. You have to be able to stop the run. And you have to run the ball to close the game out. Uh, when the weather changes, and sometimes we have to go up north and play later on in the season, no different than the NFL. Those teams that, that play outside in the north, um, you know, we used to always say in the National Football League, when the, when the leaves fall off the trees, all of a sudden the game changes. So you got to be able to run the football. Uh, and and you got to be able to throw it. And, and when you can throw it, that means you can score points. When you can't run it, it makes you one-handed. And when you can't run it, defenses, what defenses will do, they'll get after the quarterback. You know, and, and when, when you can become balanced, where you can run it and throw it, you can close the game out because now you have the ability, when you have a two-score lead going into the fourth quarter, the clock is your friend because you can run the football. Ball, right you steal possessions away from the offense when you can run the football and for me good defense and a running attack that's what travels on the road really good coach one of the things that I've always admired about you and one of the things that the kids tell me about when they're going through the recruiting process is your character and one of the things that I try to stress to them in, in reading about you is the era in which you were raised in Right. You mentioned going to high school, 68, going to Cal, but also you have a very interesting background. And I'm going to thank Trey Wingo for this. I got to know him at our Fox Sports draft party. And he had asked me, hey, ask him about growing up, ask him about their places that he couldn't live as a child because of who his parents were. Yeah, that was early. Mm -hmm. uh, my father married a war bride, a German war bride. My mom is actually 95 years old. My father passed away at 60. And, um, you know, growing up, I was born in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And then from there, we went to Germany. Um, my father was in the Army, it was tw uh, you know, 22 years uh, in the Army, Master Sergeant. And uh, we go to Germany, my sister's born. And then when we we're going to get transferred back to the United States, you're talking probably 59, somewhere right mm -hmm. around there. 1959 now. Not, not, 19, not 1939, 1959. And um, we couldn't go south hmm. because my mom was a war bride. She was white. So if you look at it back in those days, a lot of the interracial marriages, people went to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. That's where they kind of settled everybody to the West Coast, right? So we ended up going to the West Coast. As I said, uh, I lived in, in, in the neighborhood, you know, but predominantly um, multicultured. But Monterey was like uh, down the road another high school, uh, there was a Seaside High School, the one that I should have gone to, but due to the desegregation bill that was signed in 68, I got bust. Mm -hmm. So I kind of grew up in that era. You know, you, you found out, it, it, you're talking about the civil rights movement era, to be, to be quite honest. And um, being a young guy, you know, you're trying to figure out all this stuff, right, growing up. And it's amazing to me when I look at it right now, where we're at as a country, what, what I'm proud of, when I watch young people in, in, in today's world, the power they have due to social media and the platforms and how they use them to create an atmosphere where we are America. And it is, it is a collection of people, all different walks of life and different colors and different nationalities. And young people get that. They really get that. The diversity that what I've seen, the marches, it's like when you sit here going, wow. I mean, for athletes in my era, if you decided to do something or say something, you would get blackballed. You might've been out of the league. These athletes, these performers, these people, they have a platform and they use it and it's for the good. It's for the good of America. And it, it, really, it really makes me feel good inside when I watch it. I wanna, I wanna continue to ask you, uh about that, but in, in this way, I was asked to talk with a couple of uh, coaches in some closed meetings about Black Lives Matter, but also 
what can we do to help our kids understand it's important that they speak on these issues if they feel they need to? How do we empower them? How do we also say that they're a part of our program? And I look to you and, and how you have chosen to talk with your kids about this. If anything, what have you learned over the last 18 months, year that you would contribute to the rest of us? Well, that I have an obligation to do that mm -hmm. as their head coach, as a man of faith, and as a man that believes in doing the right thing on purpose, not by accident. And I think the thing that we've talked about here at this university is that um, you have to be the voice of reason. And it starts with communication. And it starts with being a good listener. Here's our problem. Sports is great in this sense. We huddle. A mass of athletes and people come together in this huddle and it becomes this team. And we all come from different walks of life, but it doesn't matter because we become a team because we huddle and we have these conversations in the huddle and some guy might believe this, another guy might believe that. But at the end, we communicate and we listen and we learn about each other. We don't huddle anymore. We want to debate. Everybody wants to take a side. It's like I was on television. I get it. Here's the subject we're going to debate. No one wants to get in a huddle anymore and listen. And I tell them this. Be the voice of reason. Have solutions. Have, a, have solutions to help solve the problems. And until we're willing to huddle and listen, you can't solve anything. Right? 11 guys walk in the huddle, and, every, and if everybody wants to call your own play, we ain't got to play. Here's the play. This is what it looks like. We've practiced it. Now let's go execute. I was taking a look at your fall schedule. And I see you got three games in 16 days. Hmm. Is that a challenge to you? Knowing that at that third game, you start up Pac-12. You got Colorado. Yeah, but that's our schedule. Okay. It's okay. Okay. We're good. I mean, you know, we don't have to play three of them all in one week. So we're good. <laughs> I mean, it, the schedule is a schedule. I never worry about the schedule so much. I just worry about us. You know, for, for me, it's about our preparation and what we have to do to get ready to play. I've done this long enough now. You know, you look at the schedule and go, okay, this is who we play. This is the opponent. Uh, we're into that right now. But, but it's more about fixing us. You know, I've always said this. When you walk on the field, there's got to be a standard that you got to live up to if you're going to be a good football team. We feel that we have a chance to be a good football team. The, all the opponents are worthy, but we can't worry about the opponents. Let's just do us and, and make people play up to our standard. We're going to play at a standard and we got to live to it. We got to practice that way. We got to prepare that way. And then we go play. That's how it works. You got a really good football team. You got a really good football team returning. You finished the season, I thought, with two of the best wins that I've seen in, in a December, December in the regular season. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask it this way. What is it that you want to see your team accomplish beyond winning a Pac-12 championship and, and getting the opportunity to play in Rose Bowl or playoff? What is it you want them to accomplish in 2021? Well, I want us, I want us to get through the season for one okay. and, 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 and do it in a way where we play the game and when we walk off the field, Regardless if you're an ASU fan or the opponent we just played against, they go, wow, those guys play football the right way. You got to honor the game of football. I tell players this all the time. We are all ambassadors for this great game, whether we coach it or play it. What are we doing to elevate the game and make the game better? That, that's what we're here to do. Make the game better for the people that follow us and play it in a way when you walk off the field, the people that watch you go, whoa, I like the way those guys play football. Hey, man, that's how I felt. Like, y'all open against USC. I'm, I'm looking at that game going, does, does, does USC know Arizona State here to fight? Did, did they know that? And it, it, toward the end, it seemed that way. But it was also that close. And when I look at what you have, particularly with Jaden Daniels, dude, I think he's thrown three interceptions in two seasons. It feels like y'all are knocking on the door of something special. And this is a quarterback who said, I want to win a Rose Bowl at Arizona State, something they haven't done 
since y'all haven't done since 1987. I'm born in 87, right? Uh, is, do you have to temper that? Do you, do you ask them to push into that? What, how, do you, how do you help him understand how hard that is to do while also not trying to put out the flame that is, yo, are you talking out of okay. school now? No, no, I, I think this, uh, you know, we, we don't, you know, we have goals that we set every year, obviously. And um, we don't talk about it a whole lot publicly. We just keep it in house. And I always tell them this, it's just, it's about us. It's just, we gotta be us and that'll be good enough. But we gotta be us every week and we have to finish. You know, we, we, we lose two games early last year. We didn't finish the game. It was us. Opponent was good. They beat us. They deserved to beat us. They made the plays and they made the plays. But when you break it all down, I always say, guys, more games are lost than won. Do the error. Just do the error. Do, do, doing the wrong thing at the right time. We can't do that. We, we, we got to get past that now. We got to get out of our own way. Let's just be us. Let's just be the best we can be. That's all I always tell players. This environment and this culture is to allow every coach and every player to be the best version of who he is. And if you do that, you got a chance. Last thing I have for you, Coach, I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm going to do it this way. Recruit me to Arizona State. What would you tell me about playing football for you? Well, first, like any player wants to know the opportunity. I, I, I guarantee you this. Um, you'll graduate. Mm. You're going to graduate. That, that's, I tell every parent, I, 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 can't, I can't give you talent. God gave you your talent. I won't let you waste it. You're going to graduate. And when you leave here, you're going to look back at your career here, regardless of what happens, whether you play a lot, don't play a lot, you're the star, you go to NFL, you're going to go, you know what? That three or four years of my life, that coaching staff and that university made a difference in my life. I left with a degree, and I'm a better man for going to school there. If I do that, I win. I win. I, I won. If I can do that, I win. I win every time. Arizona State head coach Herm Edwards joining us on the number one ranked show. Coach, thank you so much for your time, and I wish you great success this season.